Welcome, I'm Pastor Chris Titus, and we are starting our second Sunday of Lent, uh, the 40 days or so uh, journey to Easter morning. And we are reminded of the importance during Lent of doing some extra prayer, extra scripture or devotional reading, uh, and of course, focusing more intently on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Lent is built really for that purpose uh, it is a church tradition that has gone on for uh, centuries now where we are trying to keep our focus on Jesus, on our relationship with Christ, and realizing the sacrifice that he has made for us uh, on Good Friday and then the joy of Easter morning. All of that is part of understanding Lent. Now, you may have chosen, it's totally up to you, you may have chosen to make a small sacrifice of something in recognition of the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Maybe you gave up uh, chocolate or sweets or coffee or something like that. I said last uh, Sunday that maybe you want to give up something bad. Maybe you want to give up judgmental attitudes or gossip or unforgiveness along with your chocolate or coffee. So maybe give up something good that you really like and something bad that you're trying to work on. All of those things can be given as a sacrifice to Jesus in recognition of the great sacrifice he gave for us. Today we will review and continue our discussion of the Gospel of Mark. It's written sort of in a devotional style where he moves from one topic to another fairly quickly and allows us to get through a considerable amount of information uh, in the 40 days leading up to Easter. Uh, Mark is written narrowly and aggressively about the critical things that happened in Jesus' life as part of preparation for God's plan of salvation uh, through him. Leads us to the cross on Good Friday and then, of course, the resurrection on Easter morning. This is God's plan of salvation, a savior and a sacrifice for our sins. And that begins our relationship with Jesus when we begin to believe and accept God's plan of salvation. It's a rescue and renewal. Now, it's not something we deserve and it's not something we can earn. It's given to us by God's grace, mercy, and love. And that's why God's grace is amazing, as we will sing from time to time. Uh, today, I want to pick up on chapters 4 and 5 of Mark. There's a lot happening there. I'm not going to cover all the events in those chapters. I wouldn't be able to do it justice in a, in a sermon uh, this short. But I do think that we will focus on one particular teaching that Jesus gave at the beginning of chapter 4. And this is a parable that is first told to the audience that he's in front of, and then later on he clarifies it with his disciples. That's unusual for him to uh, do a teaching basically twice. And so this was one that was important, an important lesson Jesus is trying to share. Uh, now this teaching is something we also must discuss because there's something unique about it. And that is it's a parable that's told, a lesson given where he, Jesus says at the beginning and at the end of the parable, listen, hear what I am saying. And so for the Lord, obviously this was something important he was trying to communicate uh, as he gives this double warning to pay attention, to focus and listen. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to focus on this particular parable. So sometimes this narrative that Jesus gives is called the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils. Um, but to understand it, we first need to know what's a parable. And I think the best way to describe it is it's a teaching tool that was used by Jewish rabbis primarily uh, to explain complex theological things about God and explain them in more simple ways to uh, help depict common events that the audience could relate to, yet explain God's view of things, God's will, God's behavior, God's love for us. And so last week we said 80, 90 percent of Jesus's earthly ministry was performed in the Galilee, in the countryside. And so Jesus often used parables that those types of people could relate to, peasants and common folks. And he used agricultural type things because that was what they knew. And so when he told a parable to his audience, primarily he used those types of images. 
And there are other reasons, of course, that Jesus told parables. One is that he was trying to not outwardly or directly criticize the religious authorities at the beginning so that he would have time to do the lessons and training of his disciples to get them ready for his ultimate death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. He needed time to do that, to explain what the kingdom of God really was about. And as the crowds grew around him listening to him, he used parables more and more uh, to maybe veil his message a bit uh, so that the stories conveyed uh, oftentimes were subtle and the Pharisees would have difficulty bringing accusations against Jesus. Thus, this bought him a little time to continue the training of his disciples, uh, to deny the Pharisees' evidence of Jesus' direct criticism. Uh, so let me give you an example of my own parable that has this indirect criticism involved. So there once was a shepherd who spent a great deal of time in the fields with his sheep, and unfortunately, he would talk to his sheep all the time, too much, actually. He would continue to talk to his sheep well beyond what was necessary for him to get his flock safely back home. Okay, so that's a parable. What's that parable about? Well, if you substitute shepherd for pastor, which, by the way, the terms are interchangeable uh, within uh, Scripture, uh, really what I'm telling you is that preachers need to get to the point in the sermon, not drag it out, not make it long, not make it just endless. Pastors need to not talk so long. Now, notice I didn't say that directly. I didn't say that pastors are long-winded and give sermons that repeat themselves. I didn't say that but it could be implied in the parable that I just told. And so this is often how Jesus would veil some of his messages in order to convey something important, but not make it a direct criticism, just something that people could understand. And the Lord also told parables uh, that only those seeking God could really understand. So the casual listener or somebody who wasn't invested in what Christ was trying to communicate really wouldn't understand the parable. So he told for that reason as well. The bottom line is Jesus used this rabbinic tool of parables for multiple reasons. And you will see that throughout the Gospels. Uh, most often his audience was given these difficult concepts of the kingdom of God in very simple ways so that they would have the opportunity not only to learn what he was teaching, but then easily repeat the stories afterwards to others who weren't in Jesus' presence. And this is why the Gospels pick up all of these different parables. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are full of those types of teachings. Now, the Gospel of John doesn't have any parables, but that's a different type of writing, that particular Gospel. So let's dive into this important parable mentioned in Mark 4, beginning in verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parable parables and in this teaching said listen a farmer went out to sow seed as he scattered the seed some fell on the path and the birds came and ate it up some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow but when the sun came up the plants were scorched they withered because there they had no root other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked out the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30 and some 60 and some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Listen up is really what he's concluding with there. And so there's a lot in these parables. I just want to give a quick aside. According to Mark's rendering here in chapter 4, there's already a large group of people who are following Jesus around or coming to listen to Jesus uh, speak and teach. And so his ministry is really taking off, uh, so much so that he has to, um, to, 
sit out on the Sea of Galilee, the lake as it's referred to here, and, and teach. And if you've ever been around people who are out on boats or you're sitting on the shore and you listen to people who are out in the water, the, the voice is amplified. And so this was also a, a secondary benefit of Jesus sitting in the boat uh, teaching from the water. So what is Jesus trying to communicate in this particular parable? Well, scholars have analyzed this for centuries and really almost all conclude that the seed the farmer is planting is the word of God, and more particularly, the gospel. And so this is God's plan of salvation. It's being uh, thrown out uh, to take root, so to speak, within the world's population. Most agree this. And, uh, about this. And so the plan is that the seed is planted and it grows and many uh, come to know the Lord uh, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But that particular uh, sermon uh, style and un understanding that has been done frequently and is associated with many things. In fact, there'll be a video attached to this particular message. Uh, the song is called Word of God Speak. And the understanding is that this seed, this word of God, is meant to be taken in by us, protected and cared for, so that it grows in us. So that we not only understand our salvation, but we're able to get through some of the difficulties in our lives because of the promises that are contained in God's word. And if God's word is a growing seed, a growing element in our lives, then when our lives become difficult, drama-filled, discouraging and all of that, we have hope and we have help because we have God's word. We have this seed that's been given to us that's growing in us. And that seed is also enabled to grow because of the Holy Spirit, God's presence in us once we accept a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so listening to God's word is more important than ever, and especially in the world we live in. And reading God's word in the Bible is not just words on a page, it's actually this living seed that's meant to grow in us, to give us a, a harvest of hope, to encourage us. And we need encouragement in the world we live in. So if you're struggling right now, I guess my advice to you is seek the word. Go into scripture, especially the New Testament. Go in and look for things that will be encouraging to you. Seek the crop that was meant to nourish and sustain you all along, this word of God. And so, in Jesus' teaching, if the word of God described here as the farmer sowing seed, if that seed is meant to grow, uh, what else can we take from this parable? Well, today I want to look at something a little bit different than the seed. I want to look at the soil, because I think that has as much bearing on us currently as anything. As modern Christians, uh, understanding that the seed is the word of God is sort of step one, but then the question is, what about the soil? How is it received by me and others uh, when God is speaking to us through his word? People receive the gospel depending on their soil, which is why when we share our faith with other people, we get multiple reactions to that. Some people are disinterested. Some people are mildly interested. Some people are hostile. Some people have had bad church experience and they don't want to hear any more about Jesus. So you'll get all kinds of different things based on the readiness of their soil to receive that word of God. Regardless, though, we are still individually and as a church uh, encouraged by Scripture to share our faith because we're basically throwing out seeds uh, in the similar way the farmer did in Jesus' parable. So beyond the listening and hearing that we have when we initially receive the word of God, the gospel, um, what types of soil are involved for us to respond in our everyday life? In other words, with that in mind, what type of soil is your life currently composed of? If you think of the soil that Jesus talks about here as the human heart, remember he's been speaking uh, in the Gospel of Mark about the fact that it's your heart that's the most important thing that God wants to cultivate and grow, not external things. Sin is an internal problem, and so that's where God wants to work. Um, our, our stubbornness and selfishness is a heart issue, 
more so than anything else. And this is where God wants to do his best work on us. And so what's the current condition of your soil? Is it hard and tough? Is it the, is it the, is it the path? You know, are you trying to plant seeds in a parking lot on hard ground? Are you hard-hearted? Focus mostly on your needs and wants and desires as compared to thinking of others. Are you hard-headed? Nobody should look around right now, by the way, at anybody watching this video with them. Are you hard-headed, meaning are you too smart for your own good? You think you know a lot. Maybe you think you're right and everybody else is wrong on most occasions. If you're hard-headed, you're basically unwilling to admit that you need God's help to understand yourself, to understand the world around you, and to understand your interaction with other people. Yeah, I don't need God for that. That is the sign of being hard ground, hard-headed. This is like when a small child is trying to do something and a parent reaches down to help and the child says, no, I'll do it myself. And then the parent just has to sit back and watch the child fail. We do need our Heavenly Father, after all, because we are prone to sin, prone to bad decision, prone to a hard heart and a hard head in our interactions with the world and everyone else around us. I'm sure this has never happened to you, but I have been both hard-hearted and hard-headed far more than I'd like to admit in my life. In various seasons of my life, I've been both. And Jesus reminds us that we're supposed to listen to him. And there have been many times I did not do that. And usually the end results are poor. And so this parable is meant to remind us that we need to understand what kind of soil we are so that when the word of God comes to us, we have a chance for better results to improve our situation. We need to be cooperative. You need good soil for a seed to grow. So we need to be cooperative in our hearts. When the word of God grows in us through the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, we are nurtured and encouraged. And so the hard heartedness that we have or the hard headedness that we project outward to others needs to be softened. That ground needs to be cultivated so that the word of God can actually grow. Now, what about rocky soil? Does this better describe your situation? In other words, the seed could fall into the ground and potentially grow. Um, what does that look like? Well, maybe you believe and maybe you are uh, singing hymns and you are uh, doing the rituals and traditions of the place you go to worship God. Uh, maybe you're in church now and then. You're doing some of it, but your soil is shallow. It's thin. Your faith is weak. The word of God doesn't take root, Jesus describes, in the rocky soil. You don't try and deepen your faith. Maybe you have the appearance of a follower of Jesus Christ, but your words, actions, and attitudes don't reflect the love of God when you interact with the world. Why is this a bad thing? Because as Jesus says in this parable, when you have rocky soil and only some commitment to Christ, when the heat comes into your life, when the problems, when the dramas, when the difficulties happen, that sun will scorch your relationship with God and you will wither. You will lose faith. You will lose the ability to draw close to God. Whether you are dealing with something that is beyond your control or something you caused, you wither. On thin, rocky soil, you have no tap root that's gone down to secure you, to deal with the storms of life, and thus um, you have great difficulty getting through those things. This is more common than you realize. Um, this is why nearly every Sunday when I'm preaching, I remind folks and myself that we need to pray daily. We need to read our Bibles often. We need to be in church frequently because this is the way to cultivate our soil, to get some of the loose stones out of there that may distract us from God. 
We need to do those things no matter how busy we claim to be. Because if we don't tend our soil and we don't tend our relationship with Jesus Christ, what that means is that when life's challenges heat up, which they will, we are not going to be able to handle them. We are going to become exhausted in that process instead of energized to deal with difficulties through our relationship with Jesus Christ, through a strong, uh, rooted foundation um, to the Word of God. We'll be able to identify the occasional boulder, of course, that may be in our soil. But for the most part, rocky ground is difficult to identify because if you just glance out at it, it doesn't look too bad. It's only when you try to start cultivating that crop, that Word of God, that you realize you've got uh, tiny pebbles that have developed. You're preoccupied with worldly things, maybe. Money, possessions, uh, hobbies and habits that you're chasing, endless activities. Wow, we have a culture that is always on the go. So these small pebbles develop and pretty soon they become part of the rocky ground that is competing with the seed that has been given to you by God. And boom, you got problems when there's heat in your life. In my view, this is one of the biggest reasons why the world is so depressed and discouraged and full of anxiety because it has rocky, thin soil for God. What faith people do have is underdeveloped because of all these other things they're participating in, all the, all the little stones they brought into their, their soil. Let each of us, pastors included, cultivate the ground. I mean, every farmer knows that as you're plowing a field, you remove the stones. So it makes it easier to plant and it makes it easier to harvest. So Jesus' parable in Mark chapter 4 continues to talk about, well, what if the ground is um, not hard? What if it is not rocky? In fact, the ground is actually good and the seed starts to take root. The word of God starts to take root, but there are thorns or thistles that grow up and choke out the harvest that God is trying to do within us. The things that distract us from our faith, that divert us from God. What about those thorns? Well, they prevent any sort of good crop from growing. And Jesus talks about this. He's saying really that a person has left those thorns, those weeds in their garden, and therefore, the Word of God is in competition with those things and doesn't do well. It doesn't thrive. The harvest is poor because of the fact that the garden is full of weeds. To me, the biggest, toughest thorn in our relationship with Jesus Christ is busyness. It chokes out our time to pray. It limits our ability to uh, have the opportunity to read scripture. It overwhelms our busy, uh, ability to go to church because we're so busy all the time, all the time. We don't have time for anything good in our relationship with God, so very little grows. Very little good grows. Currently, our church is uh, doing a study after a service on the book of James, which is a great book, by the way, to, to glance at and be encouraged by. But James says something interesting about this particular idea of thorns and uh, about uh, our closeness to God. He says in chapter 4, verse 8, Draw closer to God and he will draw closer to you. So by implication, if I don't leave room for God, I distance myself from him. If I allow thorns to grow up in my relationship with Christ, then good is going to be choked out and replaced by whatever this is that's happening around us in the world, the chaos, confusion, and drama that we have to deal with on a daily basis. That becomes my life. By the way, I'm always curious, all the work we have to do, all the activities, all the events, all the projects, what sort of peaceful crop do they give to us? The answer is none. In fact, it could be argued that busyness only creates more busyness and exhaustion, and then we start over again. It's just an endless cycle. Busyness and distract distractions are the weeds that ruin the garden of life that God has provided us. 
And by the way, he only provides one for each of us, one life, one garden. And since that is the case, we need to stop being too busy for God. There is no harvest in it. All of us need to remember by prayer and reading our Bibles and being in church frequently that weeds in our gardens need to be removed. Things that distract us from God or cause us to be farther away from God than we need to be have to be eliminated. And when we do that, we'll have the blessings of a good crop in our relationship with Christ, which results in far more joy and peace than we ever thought about before. If the ground we have has been worked and tended, it won't be hard, it won't be rocky, and it won't be full of weeds. That's really what this parable is describing. The believer's heart, the ground, will produce great things. Yes, salvation, but also the ability to navigate and get through some of the difficulties we face in this life, the heat that's going to be applied to us. We find God's love and mercy and grace and protection and provision and all of those blessings bountiful in a harvest because we've bothered to tend our relationship with Christ. We need to prepare good soil, not only to receive the gospel message, but to live our daily lives. We'll find a lot more peace and joy and a lot less worry and challenge in a sinful world, won't we? Tending our soil, I think one of the ways to do that is just simply what we're doing right now. I would encourage you to read uh, chapters 4 and 5 of Mark, not only the parable we've covered in detail today, but all the other things that are happening. It's amazing. Uh, chapter 5 has a wonderful story of Jesus healing this wild man who's living in a graveyard, basically. There's a story of a young girl who's brought back to life. There's another um, narrative about a woman who's healed of a long illness simply by her faith that Jesus can heal her. We need good soil in our relationship with God. We need to make sure we're tending that garden. It's the only garden we're going to be given in this life. And it's never too late to cultivate. Sometimes people think, well, I've let things become overgrown and rocky, so I'm, I guess I'm out of luck. And that's not the case. We can weed and otherwise improve our relationship with Jesus Christ every single day. We choose to live in a way that shows that we want to grow and we want to change because God is ready to help us do just that. Amen? There'll be a video attached to this sermon. I hope you enjoy it. Until the next time we gather, be blessed.